You're listening to Making a Living Show. I'm Roby Levy. Hi, I'm David O'Connor from Genuine Tea, and I make tea for a living. Dave O'Connor is the chief steeping officer and co-founder of Genuine Tea, along with his partner, Sarah Wilcox. Leaders in the third wave tea movement, Genuine Tea was voted best tea in Toronto in 2017, 2018, and 2020. An appearance on Dragon's Den led to a partnership with Arlene Dickinson, and now Genuine Tea is sold in cafes and retailers across the country. Here's my chat with Dave O'Connor. Who are you and what do you make for a living? My name is David. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of Genuine Tea, and we make and sell tea for a living. So how did you get started making and selling tea for a living? Well, my partner and I actually lived in Taiwan for five years. But um, before that, I'm, as you can tell by my accent, everyone thinks I'm Australian, but I'm not. I was, I was English at one point. And uh, I grew up drinking a lot of tea. My family loves tea. Even our dog, we had a little Yorkshire Terrier growing up. He used to drink tea as well. So tea time was a very you know, common thing in, in my family. And then um, basically when my partner and I moved to Taiwan in 2010, we started drinking a lot of iced tea. And then Taiwan's very famous for its high mountain oolongs, premium quality stuff. And then basically uh, we were drinking tea a lot, ended up doing our MBAs over there. So we got scholarships to study uh, business. I went to Taiwanese university, studied Chinese, and then basically just came up with a business plan traveled to about 20 countries throughout Asia, working with farmers and moved back to Toronto, started selling tea at farmers markets, just like I'm sure you're aware, all those typical farmers market vendors that we were one of them. And then one thing led to another. And then, yeah, now we have a business. All right. So let's talk about this one thing leading to another, because there's a lot of people out there who drink a lot of tea, who (laughs) love tea, who even have done a lot of traveling, but not all of them decide that they're going to go into business making it and selling it. So what exactly happened? I mean, you had yeah. a business plan. You knew it was it was maybe a viable idea. But what made you think to actually go and do it? Well, I mean, I've always been somewhat entrepreneurial. Like I had a landscaping company with a friend of mine uh, when I was in high school. And while we did that, I also sold cannabis at the time. This is in the U.S. So it was very legal, uh, <laughs> illegal, sorry. So there was high premiums. There was, a, I guess, a risk premium, you would call it. <laughs> right. So what we would do is landscape, and then people would come and meet us wherever the truck was. So it was kind of a nice little uh, uh, facade. And then um, just throughout my life, like I've always kind of enjoyed starting things and um, kind of having an idea, but then figuring out how to execute on it. So I always wanted to be self-employed. I uh, came up with a lot of different inventions in my life. Me and my partner, who's the other side of the brain, She's the like mathematical analytical side. I'm the like, I can see five years down the line and where I want to get to, where she can kind of get it done and write a to-do list, for example. A, a skill I still don't have to this day, writing a to-do list. So she's good at that side of things. So, you know, I, I'd always said I wanted to start a business. And then we were drinking a lot of tea in Taiwan, as we mentioned. And then David's Tea and Tiavana started becoming popular in North America. And I spent most of my life in Asia. I grew up in South Korea, Hong Kong, and Taiwan as well. And, uh, you know, I knew what real authentic tea was, um, whereas what these companies were selling was a lot of artificial colors and flavors. It was very, um, they were selling fun more than tea. There was no authenticity. There was no transparency, a lot of artificial colors and flavors. And so while this trend was growing, we saw at the same time the specialty coffee movement and the bean to bar chocolate movement and the craft beer movement was happening. So we're like, okay, there's an appreciation for quality, but then there's also, on the other hand, you know, a growth of loose sleeve tea. So we're like, well, why don't we become that for tea? So that was originally the genesis of the idea. So we thought no one talks about where tea comes from. So we thought, well, let's kind of talk about that. Let's go meet the farmers, interview them, learn about the different processing methods. At the same time, we're obviously writing a business plan and we're figuring out how to monetize it. And our initial business plan actually was to open a tea bar, like a high-end cafe. Thank God we didn't have enough money to do it because we'd be bankrupt by now. <laughs> so that's, uh, yeah, that's it in a nutshell. And then where our business actually really started to take off was when we were selling tea at farmer's markets, we had like local cafes and restaurants reach out to us to sell tea to their customers. And then that's where the light bulb, like, oh, this is scalable concept came in because then you have other people selling your product for you rather than you selling it yourself. So that's that was kind of the, oh, wow, okay. So what does it take to build? Like we partnered with a local coffee roaster called Hale Coffee about six years ago. And they kind of talked to us about, talked to us about their, their wholesale programs, essentially, 
that you would build out for a cafe. Like I'm sure you have local coffee roasters in your area and they always have like a program and you'll see like their sick logo somewhere and I'll be like a really hipster like barista, like making latte art. And we're like, cool, how do we make tea like that? Cool. So that's always been our, our vision was trying to create a tea company with the soul of a coffee roaster. What I want to know is though, what happened? Like, how did you bridge the gap from we're selling at farmer's markets, which is what a lot of people do. I mean, you get a head of lettuce and you go sell it at the farmer's market. I know a lot of people that their entire existence never goes beyond farmer's market. They never get into other stores and, 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 and wind up wholesaling and, and, building out distribution. What actually took you over the edge in terms of that? How did you start going? You had this one relationship and what did that give you? Well, I think there was a element of mentorship there. I think in general, you know, I've been self-employed for six years now and I think I do believe a lot in mentorship. I have no problem reaching out to people and chatting and asking questions that I, I think that they could kind of help with. So I think that was one thing was leading into these coffee roasters for the mentorship side. In terms of the sales side, I always told myself I can sell something as long as I believe in it. And I believed in what we were doing. I believed in uh, the third wave tea movement. I believed that, you know, there should be this focus on authenticity, which is why, obviously, our brand name has like zero creativity. It's just genuine tea. We're like, you know, what's the opposite of artificial flavors? We were like, like real flavors? Reality? Should we call it reality? We're like, no, genuine tea. And then it just, I don't know, it's stuck. So yeah, I think um, it was the the not being scared to do sales, like taking rejection. Like I think also what helped is that our conversion rate was really high. Whenever we did do sales or we did do trade shows, a lot of people bought the product. Like online, I think we have a 40% uh, reorder rate. So, you know, for every 10 customers that come, four come back and buy again. So I think once you, yeah, kind of establish those relationships, whether it's B2B, B2C, and then people like what you're selling, I think it kind of, you know, it's exciting and you want to do it more. You want to grow more. You want to do more sales and you figure out creative ways. And if you get rejected, you go, okay, well, what did I say wrong there? Should I have insulted his mom? Maybe not. <laughs> so then you just kind of learn from those things and then adapt and then try again tomorrow. And then alcohol helps. Uh, always, of course. <laughs> Until a point that it doesn't, but you know, no. um, I think you were in business for, for, am I correct? Like a couple of years before you wound up on Dragon's Den. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So you had a kid and two weeks later you're on Dragon's yeah. Den. And what was the status of, of your business at that point? Like how, what level were you at? I think we're about, uh, 250 K in revenue about. So like, you know, doing pretty well, like enough to prove that there was demand for the product. We had just finished kind of creating a retail ready matcha line, which is a line of matchas called Kato Matcha, which we now sell to Whole Foods and some other places. So we were ready from that perspective. We knew our numbers inside and out. We knew what our you know blended margins were and stuff like that. So we knew we knew enough about our business. We came across, I think, intelligent enough that despite having had a kid two weeks previously and not having slept for two weeks. They believed that we were capable business people. And they always say, you know, in back the, what do they say? Back the, the person, not the business, or the back the horse, not the jockey. I don't know. There's some sort of saying about that. <laughs> <laughs> but I think um, we, we had already proven the concept. So I think four out of the six dragons, you know, they saw that. Um, and then I think one of the things we want, went on there wanting to work with Arlene because she was involved in coffee and we just saw those natural synergies and we're like, okay, well, they've created this company. Let's see if they can then take us to that level. Right. And yeah, I mean, she was clearly interested from the get-go and clearly knows that, that coffee world like you're talking about. Was being on Dragon's Den something that was always a, um, something in your sight? Like, was this planned? Was this part of your, your master plan, I guess I'm asking? <laughs> Yeah, we'd always watch the show. It was definitely a bucket list item, even way before we started Genuine Tea. I was a fan of it. Like, even when I lived in the UK, I watched the UK version. So I, it's something I always wanted to do. And Sarah also always wanted to do. So we'd watch it a lot just to learn about business. And then when the auditions were announced, we thought, you know, screw it. Like, Sarah was heavily pregnant at the time. You know, we know we have a compelling brand story. And I would say that's one of the most important things for starting a business. You asked about how we scale. I think having a compelling story, like the reason why you're starting something 
it's got to be something that people want to support. A lot of people now, they're like, oh, I'm a nutritionist and therefore I do this. And it's like, that's not enough anymore. You've got to have a good enough story or a background or, you know, an underdog story or, or a, just something that people go, okay, that's nice. Like that's what makes you different. Because ultimately, you know, a lot of people do sell tea and sell coffee, but if it's, you know, in cool packaging and it has a cool background story, I think that really helps. So tell me about then what you got from the partnership from Arlene and was it Vincenzo as well? Like, did you get two dragons involved in this? No, actually, we didn't end up taking Vincenzo's deal. We just didn't think there was enough value there in terms of what he could bring to the table. We knew what we wanted, which was like marketing support and then retail distribution. So we knew that that had happened before. And Arlene actually... um, She's got a company called District Ventures, which is essentially a venture capital firm that also has an incubator program in it. So uh, we signed the deal with her. It was 150K for 20% of the business, uh, which at the time it was a $750,000 valuation. Um, so that's what we took. We thought it was a very fair valuation. It was three times revenue. So we thought that was reasonable. Um, so we took the offer. We went out to Calgary uh, once a month, stayed in hotels in Calgary once a month for one week with a brand new baby uh, for six months to do the incubator program, which is basically a business boot camp. Uh, Us and other companies, um, and they have them every year. And that's kind of where we got to meet distributors and brokers. And, you know, I think that's probably the missing piece, the kind of Hail Mary or luck, or whatever you want to call it, that really kind of got us to the next level over like the farmer's market and local brands. A lot of businesses, a lot of competitors, a lot of like local companies that I see, the reality is they have a huge financial backing. So many of these juice companies and coffee roasters, like they look like they're starting from the bottom, just and very similar to Drake. They say they're starting from the bottom, but just like Drake started in Forest Hill, you know, these companies are not starting from the bottom. They hire top-end designers and pay $50,000 for a logo. Um, and they're very good at crafting that message, whereas we genuinely didn't have the money. So we needed that money in order to play, you know, ball with Drake, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> what were you doing to start the business? Like, what nest egg did you have that you were able to start off and actually build up a quarter million dollar a year revenue? Okay, so a few things. Um, we were teaching English in Taiwan. So doing that, you can save about a grand a month. Living in Taiwan is very affordable. The pay is very good to teach English. You make like $23 an hour. And our rent that had like (laughs) a movie room and a swimming pool was like $400 a month. So like, you know, we're making $23 an hour, but we're paying each like two, two fifty a month in rent. So we could cover our rent in a day and a half of work which is something that people could only dream of in Canada. So that we were able to save money doing that. And then also, as I mentioned, when we did the MBA program, we were able to get the Taiwan scholarship. So the Taiwan scholarship is what they offer to foreigners because they're trying to recruit more international students for a number of reasons. One's declining birth rate. They need to get more students in. Another one is Taiwan really wants self-determination so that they don't have to deal with China. So they want more and more foreigners coming in and kind of uh, helping create those business ties. So they have this thing called the Taiwan Scholarship. So it waives all of your tuition fees for the MBA program. And then on top of that, we were given 700 US dollars each a month. Um, And as I said, our rent was about 500. So, you know, you do the math, like we just ended up saving. So we had about 20-ish plus thousand dollars when we started then there's this program called the futurepreneur program of canada which uh, helps small businesses so we took out two loans through that business program uh which totaled around forty five thousand. then we did start a company which was a five thousand dollar grant and another one uh called summer company which was a three thousand dollar grant so we were just we're very good at filling out forms and that again (laughs) i told you my partner she's the one who does the 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 to-do list um, she's really good at filling out forms. And there's so much grant money and funding money. Like for our IST, for example, we got 15 grand from the government to, to do that. We just applied for a scholarship, uh, not a scholarship, a grant in conjunction with uh, a college to help kind of do the formulations on that. So, 
Yeah, the, the, the money is out there. If you have an idea to start a business, start looking for grants and scholarships and, uh, and lo- loans, especially now during the pandemic. Like the cost of borrowing money is so, so low, which is why housing prices are so, so expensive. But also at the same time, it's like, well, you may as well take the free money. It's raining money right now. Okay, so basically, yeah, you, so you were cobbling together money from your own pockets, from grants, from, I, I'm assuming, some sort of tax credits, those sort of things, various uh, scholarships, as you're saying. And, but you were basically, you were bootstrapping it. You were putting it together yourself. You were working at a home, and then it was Dragon's Den. And from Dragon's Den, that allowed you to move into the beautiful facilities in which you reside currently. This is our fourth office. So our first office, yeah, fourth office since, well, five years. On, well, yeah, it was, I think, four and four years. So the first one was our apartment, very illegal. Uh, <laughs> second one, we found a video editing suite that uh, a guy was renting out for $500 a month, uh, him and his dog <laughs> Jasper. So we used that. And then the third one was legit. Uh, and then this one is the fourth, which is even more legit. So this one's inspected, like fully organic and everything like that. I want to know, what does what a day of making and selling tea look like? Um, well, I mean, for us, like we're the bosses. So, you know, every day is different. For me, it involves a lot of uh, replying to emails, <laughs> <laughs> mostly doing sales, uh, coming up with cool collaborations. Uh, a lot of it now is very e-commerce focused. So things like talking to our... Um, conversion agency, you know, increasing our ad spend, looking at our copy, looking at our, you know, our assets, our photography, figuring out if we can make those better, what kind of promotions are we running right now is Valentine's Day. So it's, for me, I'm more of the marketing guy. So that's what my day today is. For my partner, she deals with the accounting side, HR, payroll. And um, we actually just implemented a new ERP system, which is basically a system. It's like the brains behind the business. So it, it just ma- tracks all the inventory, all the expenses and everything. So that's something we just onboarded. But in terms of like what the team does day to day, it's literally just taking tea, blending tea, scooping it like in the little bags like this. He's holding a little bag. This. this is an audio, an yeah. audio program. Oh, yeah. so it's a so, little bag. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a little 50 gram pouch. Uh, they're fully recyclable, by the way. Um, and then sending it through a band sealer, which is essentially a sealing machine. And then that's it. Uh, people order them online and then we, we send them out, stick them in boxes. It's as basic of a business model as you can imagine. You buy something in bulk for a certain price and then you put it into smaller packages or you do add some value to it by blending it or putting in some rose petals or whatnot. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty much it. And is the majority of your of your business right now, is it making things for wholesale or is it making things for direct to, to consumer? Um, Pre-COVID, we were 80% food service. So that was cafes, restaurants, offices. We had a lot of big office accounts like uh, Salesforce, LinkedIn, a lot of those kind of guys. Uh, but then obviously COVID hit. We did get shut down. Like our revenue went down to like 20, 30% of what it was in Q1 come April. So that really forced us. We took the subsidies. We took the CRB, CRB. Everyone went down hours. One of our employees actually became a full-time babysitter to take care of our kid because daycares were closed. So that kind of forced us to change our business model. So instead of focusing as much on the B2B food service side, we started focusing more on the B2B grocery side and then the B2C online side. And then also we were doing the R&D on the iced tea as well, which was a nice thing to keep us busy because it was fun to do coming up with the designs for a can of iced tea. And it, it's more of a fun product, I think, to sell. Uh, not that loose leaf tea is not fun. It's just like an iced tea is cool. It's like you can do it with cocktails and stuff. Makes people think they're going to the beach. Yeah, exactly. So we do have photos of people on boats drinking iced tea and, you know, Making you feel worthless. No, just kidding. (laughs) Isn't that all advertising is, really? It's just like companies making you feel worthless and then saying, (laughs) but not all is lost. If you buy this car, you won't be a worthless piece of shit. And this girl (laughs) may or may not go on a date with you. Odds are she won't. (laughs) But still. Get in Mitsubishi and ride the thrill or whatever they say. Um, <laughs> so what's your big slogan then? What, what do you get if you buy, if we buy genuine iced tea? Ride, ride the thrill. Ride no, the it's thrill. not ride the thrill. <laughs> no, I just made that up. 
uh, what is actually our new tagline is genuine tea. Um, <laughs> it's kind of a long one though, but it kind of it, it encapsulates our, our brand DNA, if you will. It's born in the tea fields of Taiwan, raised on the streets of Toronto. Genuine tea is at the crossroads of tradition and innovation. It just rolls off the tongue. It's not a slogan. It's not like, eat fresh. <laughs> um, I'm loving it. No, but it's it's really like, it's something we came up with because we were so focused on a tradition and the authenticity and the origin and the culture behind the tea. But then we were like, well, how can we also be going into iced tea? I'm also working on a hard tea as well. So an alcohol infused tea with uh, Collective Arts, which is a local brewery. In Hamilton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They actually opened a brewery in Toronto too. Oh, really? So um, yeah, like basically that's kind of our, I guess, brand DNA is like this traditional piece, but then infused with kind of a modern uh, spark, as it were. Yeah, but back to your very early question before I rambled on, our day-to-day is basically right now is a lot of fulfilling online orders. Our online store is up 500% since COVID. You guys are actually bringing it in. You're creating the teas there. You're packaging the teas there and you're fulfilling it. Is there any part mm-hmm. of this that you're looking to send out to another party to actually finish for you? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, you know, we outsource our sales, for example, a lot of it, like the grocery side. We outsource our social media. Uh, we outsource our design work. We outsource conversion, like ad buying. So. Like something that I've always struggled with is if you outsource everything, what's left, you know, you got to have something that makes you different. And I have looked at co-packers who can do the blending and the packaging into the small 50 gram pouches. And for a number of reasons, it doesn't work. For one, we have a lot of SKUs. Uh, We have a lot of products. So we like to be able to have a lot of products. But if you work with a co-manufacturer, they'll have minimum run sizes of like, let's say a thousand or 2000 per tea. But if we have 50 teas or we want to bring in a limited edition or small batch something, we don't want thousands and thousands of that product laying around in the event that it's a flop. So doing it in house gives us more control. It also gives us a culture because it gives us employees. Like if we didn't have employees and we outsourced everything and we just sat at home on laptops, we wouldn't really have much of a company culture. So I think that was kind of part of it is realizing like we need to create something. And then also like we've discovered that there's other lucrative sides of the business as well that are not under our brand. So doing things like white label for other companies where more and more people are reaching out to us about private labels. So other tea companies asking about potentially packaging stuff for them. And it's just like, well, we have the ability to do it. And as far as I'm aware, there are no companies out there that can do this kind of small run manufacturing that potentially that could lend itself to other business opportunities down the line you know like let's say you know our next move like let's say we were to buy a building you know like financed obviously not we don't have the money but like as i said it's raining money right now like banks will finance buildings for example so let's say you know in a utopian ideal world we we got a five thousand square foot building finance then we got it inspected now you have this giant space where you can theoretically have a brand, operate your brand out of it, but then also operate other channels as well. So a manufacturing white label component for someone else, which could bring in more revenue uh, or potentially starting another e-commerce thing that's like similar, but slightly different. So I think that um, obviously that's a very long winded explanation for why we don't want to outsource everything. But I think we want to learn as well. You know, like Sarah is very involved. Sarah, my partner, is very involved in the finances and the book side of things. And I'm very involved in the e-commerce side of things and with the Facebook advertising because I don't want to be an idiot. Like this is new stuff and we just want we want to learn how to build a business. If you outsource everything, what are you really learning if you're relying on other people to do everything for you? Well, and that's, it's kind of a funny thing you say that because I think for a lot of people, learning to run a business, I think, means for a lot of folks outsource everything and make sure you've got your supply chain all figured out. And uh, in the end, you just you know sit on a beach and as you're saying, uh, you know, cash checks and uh, listen to brilliant podcasts. But yeah, at right. the end of the day, there's something really rewarding about having your hands dirty. I mean, whether it's literally or figuratively. So to, to make the company be something that's actually different and about something means actually infusing it with yourself. Yeah. 
I think so. We're very much part of the brand. Like even our names are on the Oh, not anymore. We took it off. <laughs> well, we used to have our names on the packaging that said Sarah and Dave at the bottom. But um, yeah, I do think that, yeah, if you outsource everything, that there isn't, there isn't much left of the, the brand. And you can tell that with some companies that come out of the gate, super polished, obviously heavily financially backed, but they just lack something. They lack that authenticity. There's no shots of things being grown or made or blended or it's just like the owners are, you know, it's their tense company that they've started. And, you know, it, yeah, it just lacks that genuineness, for lack of a better not word. What are you hoping to achieve ultimately? Is there, is there an end goal with this company? Um, not necessarily. I think we've achieved it in many ways, which is kind of financial independence. You know, we, we now get fairly respectable salaries. Um, which I think was something that we sacrificed for a long time. I think, you know, for the first three years. And a lot of people think starting a business is going to be uh, entrepreneurship. Yeah, you can go to the beach, you can do what you want and work when you want. But the reality is for the first three years, you've got to be willing to live on the poverty line. Um, now that we've gone beyond that, I would say we have achieved what we've wanted to, what we set out to do, which was to be financially self-sustaining you know we just bought a house in a pandemic which was crazy because we paid too much for it but we're moving up to Collingwood just because we've been priced out of Toronto but also because I think that's really what we wanted to achieve was just to be, uh, be able to take care of our family and just to reach that financial independence now I feel like anything else that, that comes out of it will just be like you know the icing on the cake so to speak I mean, one of the major things that drove you and your partner to get into this business was your love of travel. And obviously with the pandemic, it's simply not possible. But even before that, as you're saying, when you're investing in a company, when you're investing in an idea and when you're creating a product and bringing it to market, you're working massive hours and you're getting paid nothing and you're probably not sleeping too much. Put a baby on top of that. Now you have warehouses and product and things in place. What has that done to your travel plans what has that done to the inspiration that, that, that all went into this in the first place um well covid obviously put a giant dagger into the heart of everyone's travel dreams for us we were still able to travel you know we did a tea sourcing trip two years in like there was yeah two years after starting genuine tea we did a sourcing trip to kyoto in japan which was really good that was surely before we launched our matcha line it was just to like meet farmers and learn about the process and everything and we actually built the whole matcha brand around them because the head farmer actually plays mozart to the tea leaves and we were like that's such a cool story <laughs> so we kind of took that story and built the company out of it but um mozart matcha yeah no it's called Cato matcha it's named after the, the family but yeah like the traveling thing you know we were supposed to go last spring back to taiwan um we were going to take jacob with us i think we're going to keep trying to travel once things open up Thankfully, we have a lot of old content we can still use, although I look a lot younger. <laughs> but uh, yeah, like the hope is that we'll still be able to travel and it'll be financed by tea and it'll be for the pursuit of tea and we'll expense the hotels because of tea and it'll be work because of tea. So I think that that in many ways is kind of the dream, I think. Yeah, having your business, having something you created actually be the vehicle upon which you can continue to build and where you can travel and where you can see more and do more is pretty exciting. I think that's what a lot of people get into making, whether it's art or whether it's product or, uh, or even, or even some services, you know, they, they sort of become your vehicle for actually getting to where you want to go literally and figuratively. Yeah, exactly. It becomes your full-time job, but at the same time, it can be fun if you allow it to be, it can be creative if you want it to be. And I think one of the things too, like, being, I'm sure a lot of the guests you've spoken to on the show, maybe they haven't mentioned this, but one of the best things about being self-employed is there is some creativity from an income perspective. Uh, you know, like we were able to have low income, which allowed us to get childcare subsidy, for example. Then also you can use your business to get a car that you otherwise would probably not be able to afford not like you're like buying a Mercedes, but like even the idea of like buying a car for a lot of people is it, it's too expensive. But as a business expense, it seems manageable. The business pays for the gas, which makes your income go further. So there's lots of ways that people use, you know, being self-employed and, and like the revenue and totally legally as well. 
to make their own personal incomes go a little bit further. So I think that's one of the best benefits, I think. But then a flip side of that is there's no pension. There's, you know, obviously a lot of things that come with security and knowing that you can retire at 60, 65. So there's, there's two sides to every, every coin. Yeah, that's provided you act, your pension actually comes to fruition. For a lot of people, they're switching jobs too fast. To, you know, no, nobody stays with the company for 30 years anymore. Yeah, exactly. No, I know. And like, there won't be any pension left for our generation anyway. <laughs> and on that delightful note, what advice do you have for somebody who wants to get into the tea game or for that matter, the ownership of a business that is not currently served? Um, I would say my advice would be very practical. It would be come up with a business plan, first and foremost. Do your market research. Is there an opportunity? What makes you different? Find suppliers for whatever it is you're getting into. Uh, and then find a good story and a good brand. And then lastly, know your audience. And I think if you can do all those things, you can find a product that you think uh, people will buy. Then lastly, it just kind of comes down to how are you going to sell that product? Obviously, nowadays with e-commerce, it's super easy to get your stuff in front of people's eyeballs. But I think that that's kind of my advice from a very practical sense. My other advice would be if you really want to be an entrepreneur, you have to acknowledge that it's going to be working on less than minimum wage for multiple years. If you think you can hack that, then go for it because, you know, it's a grind. But like with anything, like the more you grind versus everyone else, the further you get ahead. And the further ahead you get, the less and less competition there is. And it's like that with anything. Like, I think it's, I think almost as kids, we get lied to by our parents saying like, oh, you know, like get a job in business because there's so many jobs in business. Don't pursue a, a career in podcasting, for example, because that's a crazy, <laughs> oh, that didn't exist. But you know what I mean? Like a career in entertainment. They always told us like, that's ridiculous. Become something easy, like a doctor. It's like, yeah, right. Actually becoming an actor is probably, or a radio host is probably way um, easier than becoming a doctor for one. And the harder you grind and the further ahead you get and the more years you commit to doing it, then there's less and less people competing with you. So it actually does become easier. You figure out your craft, you develop new skills, you network, which is very important. So I think it's all about the grind, whether it's selling tea, a product-based business or a service-based business or entertainment, just stick to it, commit to it. And then over time, theoretically, <laughs> you should see the fruits of your labor. Dave, where can people find out more about you? Uh, go to genuinetea.ca. You can buy all of our tea there. We're in some select grocery stores across the country um, and obviously coffee shops as well. But uh, for a full range of all of our products and to learn more about the brand, uh, go to our website or check us out on Instagram at Genuine Tea. Thank you so much for being on the show and sharing how you make a living. Yeah, awesome. I'd appreciate it. Subscribe to Making a Living Show on Apple, Google, Spotify, Stitcher, and pretty much anywhere else you get your podcasts. For more on the show, visit makingalivingshow.com and follow along on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. Making a Living Show is produced by Next Exit Media and hosted by me, Roby Levy. Thanks for listening.